Okay, so we are recording, and it appears to be recording actual sound, so I think we're in business. Uh, and uh, here we go. Last time we were talking about uh, Stokes's theorem. Uh, well, I should say Stokes's curl theorem. And uh, here it is, uh, kind of the first uh, version that we saw of it, um, arguably, depending on how you count. And uh, notice um, uh, that uh, this allows for computing circulation, just like Green's theorem did. This is a, you know, for uh, circulation around boundaries of two-dimensional surfaces in space, as opposed to, for Green's theorem, circulation around the boundary curve of a two-dimensional region in R2, right? So this is the three-dimensional version instead of a two-dimensional version, but it's morally very, very similar. Um, again, kind of a two-dimensional integral, uh, surface integral instead of a double integral, but that's just, again, appropriate to the context. Um, and uh, the integrand is not Green's operator. The integrand is curl. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this fact that curl is the operator here in this theorem that looks so much like Green's theorem, that's why in Green's theorem, you may recall, I mentioned uh, that uh, some people refer to Green's operator as curl because Green's operator plays the exact, I mean, analogous role that curl does just in this sort of, uh, you know, in three-dimensional theorem as opposed to the two-dimensional theorem. Okay. All right. Um, so, again, this is the, uh, whoops, uh, the, uh, our first version of seeing this algebraically. But recall, this is really the point of view that I want you to think of it as, uh, that circulation is an integral of circulation density. Right? Um, all of these, what I like to call accumulation theorems, um, are about how an accumulating quantity can be thought of where the whole is the sum of the parts, and on each part... We're talking about a density times a size. Yeah, question. Uh, could you remind us what the ds vector means? Yeah, so the ds vector uh, is right here. The, the ds vector is uh, the vector that we use to represent this product. Um, the uh, unit normal vector times the ds you know, area differential scalar. Um, so the big benefit of calling this the ds vector as a single thing uh, is that this single thing encapsulates everything you might want to know about a little piece of surface. Uh, it tells you how big it is, and it tells you how it's oriented because of those two factors. Is that cool? Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So uh, another way to think of it is that it's just notation to represent uh, in DS, which you know comes up a, a lot in a lot of different calculations. Okay. All right, so a uh, reminder, we have this big diagram that we've been assembling, and now just for uh, cosmetic reasons, I'm going to switch. Oh, oh, and I forgot to click the, uh, the other little thing here, which I have to click twice for reasons I don't understand. And there, okay, now my, I know y'all didn't see anything, but it's going to look better on my screen now. Um, so uh, this uh, typeset version of the diagram, it's the same exact diagram. But it's easier to read. So previously, we talked about the fundamental theorem of line integrals as being sort of summarized by uh, this, right? And then we talked about how Gauss's divergence theorem shockingly follows the same exact pattern. Same exact pattern. Now, to be fair, yeah, it's about three-dimensional regions and their boundary surfaces instead of a one-dimensional curve and its boundary points. Yeah, 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 sure, different. Uh, it's about triple integrals and vector surface integrals. Yeah, 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 again, different, granted, right? But the pattern is extremely strong. And what we see now is that Stokes' curl theorem follows the exact same pattern. So uh, take the curl of a vector field, take the boundary of a surface in space, and the vector line integral of the original vector field around that closed boundary uh, curve, a.k.a. circulation, the flux of the curl of the original vector field, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, the, the, the curl uh, 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 through the original surface uh, uh, give you the same thing, and I don't know why I broke my pattern there. So same exact pattern on the diagram, 
right? A real eyebrow razor, right? This pattern, we're three for three on this pattern, holding and making sense in the three different sort of spots that uh, it has the potential to make sense on this diagram. Um, so I am a huge fan of uh, students thinking in terms of these diagrams because now you don't have really three separate theorems to understand. You have one pattern to understand. Right? And yeah, sure, then you also want to think through, you know, geometrically, uh, how do I visualize that geometrically in each of these contexts? Sure, sure, sure. Right? But you only have one pattern to keep track of, and the diagram tells you explicitly how to apply that pattern in all these different contexts. And it's extremely helpful. And uh, full disclosure, when I uh, am doing vector calculus myself, uh, I always am, uh, this is... Uh, it, it, it forefront in my mind when I'm thinking about vector calculus and uh, let's see what am I going to do about the thing and I have what do I know about this vector field oh I know the such and such and that I, I see where am I on this diagram and then I let the diagram guide my thoughts okay all right uh, let's see here somehow I managed to lose my other arrow there okay here we go so uh, yeah let's do an example let's punch one up uh, so we're going to uh, compute this line integral of a vector field on a curve. Now, uh, reminder, there are uh, various methods for computing line integrals. And we have a bunch of tools and therefore a bunch of options. One thing we could do is parameterize and plug and chug. Oh my gosh, it's already parameterized. It's like it's begging me to pull back through this parameterization and plug and chug. But I think you can see the algebra on that would get a little hairy, uh, pretty easy pitch that, uh, keep in mind, this is what x is, right? That's x. Uh, so that goes there and there. And so we are going to have cosine squared. And then, of course, this is y, uh, which means that we're going to have, uh -oh, we're going to have an e to the power of sine t. Ah, that's, yeah, I'm not saying it can't be done, right? But that's, it's going to be weird and uh, I'm not encouraged. Um, okay, so um, other options for how to compute a vector line integral. Hey, maybe the fundamental theorem of line integrals, right? It's worth a shot, um, and you can try, and what you're going to find is that the fundamental theorem of line integrals will not apply here because there is no anti-gradient. So anyway, but nevertheless, that is an option, and that's uh, you know something that should always be entertained. It's just not going to work in this case. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Green's theorem. Maybe we could use Green's theorem. Wrong universe. We are in three dimensions. Right? This is a line integral in three dimensions. Green's theorem is peculiar to two dimensions only. Okay. All right. So various different options on how to compute. Keep in mind your job, one of your jobs as students is to be able to look for the right earmarks and make good choices on which method to use. Right? Because that's how it comes up in life, by which I mean you know, any sort of uh, academic pursuit that makes use of multivariable calculus. So if you're an engineering major or physics major or what have you, and you're going to be computing line integrals, right? Um, they're going to come up organically. There's not going to be any free indication of what method you should use. And so you're always going to have to sort of be uh, thinking about how to diagnose your methods. And we'll talk more about how to do good diagnosis later. For the moment... We're going to use Stokes' curl theorem here, probably obvious, since we just got through talking about Stokes' curl theorem. Uh, so, uh, all right, let's uh, see. Uh, can I use, well, let, let me do it this way. Let me come to uh, the diagram over here. Uh, let me clean up my mess. And now we ask the question, can I use Stokes' curl theorem? Well, I was given a line integral. Um, Stokes' curl theorem pertains to line integrals. Can we use it? And uh, very important asterisk with Stokes' curl theorem, as with all of these theorems, there's always a catch. Um, if you want to compute a line integral with Stokes' curl theorem, notice it says right there, your curve has to be a boundary of a surface. And again, notice this is not some sort of you know formality or uh, you know fussiness of uh, of, of any sort. Um, you need your curve to be the boundary of a surface because that surface had better exist because it's the surface for your resulting flux integral. If your curve isn't a boundary of something, 
then there is no something through which to compute a flux. There, it's not that Stokes' theorem is wrong, it's that Stokes' theorem doesn't apply or even make sense if your curve is not a boundary. Is everybody comfortable with that? A really big point. Um, okay. Oops. Um, yeah, okay, so we need to ask, uh, is our surface here, excuse me, is our curve here a boundary? And uh, this is just a matter of drawing a picture. I, uh, okay, that's fine. Uh, here's our curve. Not hard to persuade yourself from the parameterization. That's what that curve looks like. Is that a boundary of a surface? Why? Yes, it is. It's the boundary of a surface that looks like that. Is everybody good? Now, I've just committed a minor little oversight. I did it on purpose, for dramatic purposes. Right? Um, here's the problem. I said boundary without giving any consideration to orientations. And that's not appropriate. Right? Uh, the word boundary henceforth, uh, and uh, you know, henceforth as of several days ago, uh, the word boundary always implies something about orientations, and that's always critical. So we have to think about orientations here. So this curve, yeah, 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 it's parameterized a certain way, but because of that parameterization, there is an implied orientation. And this curve, as t increases, goes that way. Yeah? Everybody happy with that? I mean, just think about what happens as T increases, and you, you can just plot a few points even if it's, uh, you can also compute the derivative of this parametric curve, and you'll notice that the derivative is tangent uh, in that direction. Okay, so when I say that this curve is a boundary of that surface, I'm really not done yet. I have to ask specifically which orientation on this surface gives the correct boundary on the on the curve, right? The curve has a given orientation. That's not negotiable. The curve has to be oriented a la purple arrow there. So I've got to ask, which of these two orientation options, is it that one or is it, uh, you know, that one? Which of these two possible orientations is correct? Let's start by considering uh, what um, is going to end up being the wrong answer, just so we don't... Um, have to pursue a wrong answer after we know the right one. Right? It seems silly. Um, so let's consider this as a possibility. If that were um, the uh, the orientation on the surface, what would be the induced orientation on the curve? And we're going to play the game. Right hands, right? Um, arbitrary but standard. Your right hand, you take your thumb and you point it in the direction of your surface orientation that we're considering here. So thumb down. You look at your fingers, right hand again, very important. I know sometimes you might be holding the pencil in your right hand. It might be more convenient to use your left hand. Guarantee wrong answer, right? <laughs> it's got to be your right hand. So thumb in the direction of the surface normal. Look at the direction that your fingers point. Your fingers define then a swirl around that normal vector, and that would have the curve orientation be that way, which I know is wrong. Because that's not what we were given, right? We were given our curve is oriented in the purple direction. Everybody on board? Okay. All right, well, hey, look, we tried. Uh, that just, it just didn't, uh, that it didn't work out. Uh, so let's see, now let's try what we know is going to end up being the right answer, if I can find that little eraser button. Okay, there it is. It moved on me. Um, so let's try this now as a possible orientation. And thumb, right hand, critically right hand. Fingers define a swirl. The swirl goes that way, which defines this orientation by the side swipe, which is the correct orientation perfectly consistent with the orientation that we were given from the parameterization, and we win. Okay, everybody happy? Um, if you get the wrong orientation, you're off by a minus sign, and again, there's a temptation to say, ah, come on, sign error, what's the big deal? It happens to the best of us. Well, you got to keep in mind, mm, excuse me, you got to keep in mind, um, it's not about how far off your answer is, it's about what's wrong with the reasoning, right? And the reasoning is a, a, a sophisticated, tricky idea 
that is a substantial portion of, of uh, the material that we're talking about, right? So even though it's just off by a minus sign, right? It's in, again, it's about the reasoning, not the result. And misunderstanding orientations is significant um, part of the relevant part of the reasoning. Is everybody happy, comfortable with that? Okay, so make sure to be careful with orientations. Okay, and off we go. We have a boundary uh, because our curve is a boundary. I am welcome to invoke Stokes' theorem. Right, Stokes' theorem applies. Um, and uh, again, there it is from the diagram. That's how you remember it. That's certainly how I remember it, by the way. Right, and again, if you have the diagram comfortably uh, understood. Uh, then this will never lead you wrong. Uh, keep in mind, all you really have to remember is what direction these operators go because everything else kind of follows sort of obviously. Um, line integrals and flux integrals. I mean, we're going to end up having done enough of those that you won't be able to forget <laughs> that those are the operators that we do here. Um, triple integrals, sort of obviously. What else could you do with a function other than plug points into it? Right. So, I mean... The, that part really makes sense. Um, boundaries, you don't need to memorize what kinds of things you get when you take boundaries. That's just geometry. That should be intuitively comfortable, I would hope. Um, and so really, again, uh, kind of all you have to do is memorize um, the order of those three operations. And you have to memorize the pattern And uh, that's it. That uh, everything else uh, follows from these things and the geometrically uh, intuitive. So um, I propose that everyone should make an attempt to memorize this entire diagram. Which again, you know, at first glance, you're like, oh my gosh, look at all those symbols. It's so much to memorize. Don't memorize the symbols. Memorize the patterns. Memorize the ideas. It's not that hard. In fact you may have inadvertently already memorized this diagram, right? So I want to encourage everybody to take out a clean sheet of paper at some opportune moment, not now, of course, uh, and uh, see if you can just reproduce this diagram on a clean sheet of paper. If you can't, that'd be a nice indication of, uh, you know, wh wherever you fall short in your attempt to reproduce this diagram, nice indication of maybe uh, what it is that you need to study up on or ask questions about in office hours or what have you. Okay. All right, moving along. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, back to here. Okay, so we're going to, um, having applied Stokes' theorem, uh, we just, we no longer have to think of this question as a circulation. We can think of it as computing a flux of the curl vector field. Now, yes, we do have to actually compute that curl. Okay, and I'm going to need to zoom out can fit this all on the screen. So I've got to take this vector field here and I've got to compute its curl. <sighs> Annoying little uh, calculation with the symbolic determinant, with the symbolic cross product uh, and, you know, the various partials and don't forget the minus signs. Okay, so, but you should know at this point how to compute curl, right? Make sure that you can, certainly. Um, and uh, anyway, you compute the curl for this vector field, and it ends up being just 0, 0, 2, as it turns out. Isn't that nice, by the way? The original vector field was kind of ugly. The curl is a constant full of our favorite number, 0. Right, so that's uh, wonderful good news. All right. Uh, the ds vector, of course, is... Uh, uh, n times the ds scalar, and n, as we've already discussed, is 0, 0, 1. Right? Everybody happy? And uh, so now it's kind of all over for the shouting. I mean, you know, this is an easy dot product to do. Uh, the dot product is 2. 2 being a constant, it factors outside of the integral. That leaves me only with integral ds. Namely, it leaves me with only needing to compute the surface area. The surface area here is, again, a freebie because uh, that's uh, a, a barnyard variety geometric figure, and we win. Everybody happy? Okay. All right, so that's the play-by-play -play, uh, to how to 
how to do a uh, Stokes's curl theorem problem. Now, uh, of course, it won't always be exactly like this. Sometimes the curl won't be a constant. For example, that was, again, manufactured, right? Uh, but uh, it turns one question into a different question. And again, that's uh, very useful because half the time, the, the ensuing question will be easier than the original question. So it's a very worthwhile uh, tool. Okay. All right, so uh, now I'm going to go back to something that I skipped previously. Uh, you may recall I skipped this discussion about um, uh, I, I revisited the fundamental theorem of line integrals, and I make some claims here about how to interpret the curl vector and what does that look like geometrically. And uh, I am going to cover that now, but I'm going to do it uh, on my uh, 219 lecture notes. And, of course, I'm in the wrong spot because um, silly me. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, I like the write-up in here just a little bit better. Um, so I want to talk about the idea of an oriented density. I know that sounds weird. I mean, let's think about it for a quick moment. What is a density? Stuff per unit size, right? Well, stuff, stuff, it, it's a scalar, isn't it? So uh, shouldn't density intrinsically be a scalar quantity? And as formulated, yes. What I want to do here is introduce a related idea called an oriented density, and it goes like this. Uh, the, I think the nice, uh, the best sort of starter example is uh, with the fundamental theorem of line integrals. And keep in mind, here's our fundamental theorem of line integrals. Change, our accumulating quantity called change, which you know very often gets written as f of b minus f of a. Fine, but change is the quantity in question. Can be thought of as a vector line integral. Right, sure. Uh, let me say that differently. On any given little piece of curve, um, that little piece of change can be thought of as, well, either one of these expressions. Now, if I want to talk density, I need to talk about accumulating quantity of change per unit size. And ds is the size. Length is the size of a little piece of, piece of curve. So if you want to talk density, change per unit size, well, it's, uh, it's not the gradient. It's gradient dot t. And there's a couple of things that are just really uncomfortable about this. Uh, I want to be able to talk about something intrinsic to the function. And while the gradient is intrinsic to the function, the unit tangent vector is not. The unit tangent vector is intrinsic to the curve, not the function whose change I'm interested in. So that's just a little bit awkward and weird. Um, so notice, though, rather than look at this formula here, right? let me instead just look at this formula here. That's all I'm going to do. Just a slight different perspective on how we're going to compute this little piece of change. And so now, again, density is typically thought of as quantity per unit size. dx isn't exactly size, but you know what it is? One could argue this is oriented size. Think about what the dx vector is. What does the dx vector represent? It's a vector whose magnitude is the size. That's the whole point of it, is its magnitude is the size of the little piece of curve that I'm looking at. And the only thing is, dx also has more information in it. dx also points in a direction. It, it's an oriented thing. It points in the direction that the curve is going, right? Um, so it's an oriented thing, but it also represents size. So I'm going to call this an oriented size. And then, if you will, and again, this is you know this is just an interpretation, so uh, don't hold me to it, right? Just a reasonable interpretation. If change per unit size is density, then don't you feel change per unit oriented size should be oriented density? And that's what the gradient is, if you think about it. The, the gradient is telling you how fast things are changing, but it's also pointing in a direction. It's pointing in the direction that that change is happening. 
So again, telling you two things. The gradient is telling you how steep is the hill, how fast is the function changing, change per unit distance, you know, as you go in the maximal direction, right? The, so how steep is the hill? And it's oriented, thus telling you in what direction is uphill, in what direction is that change happening the fastest. So thus the term oriented density, and of course the object in question uh, being uh, change, uh, oriented change density. How are we doing? Everybody willing to play along on that? It's just a sort of a, we're broadening our notion of what a density is from scalar quantity per unit scalar size to quantity per unit oriented size. All right, now conveniently throughout this discussion, we're able to lean on the fact that, uh, well, frankly, we already understand gradient pretty well. We knew already that gradient has a magnitude that tells you how steep the hill is. We knew already that gradient points in the direction which is directly uphill. So think of this as not new information about gradient. Think of this as a plausibility check, proof of concept, that it's reasonable to interpret an idea called oriented density. It makes great sense here. Um, so with that confirmation, Let's now look at Stokes' curl theorem. Here's Stokes' curl theorem, the formulas that we've written down uh, last time and at the start of today's lecture. Um, and uh, yeah, so circulation can be thought of as either one of these integrals. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, on any given little piece, the amount of circulation on that piece can be thought of as either one of these formulas. And in the sense of accumulating quantity stuff per unit size, size being area, ds, circulation density is this product. And again, it tells me something about the vector field, but it also uh, tragically uh, involves uh, this thing here, uh, the normal vector, which is not intrinsic to the vector field. It's, it's intrinsic to the surface. That's weird. Um, I, mm, I would like to have something that I can talk about that uh, comes only from the vector field. And uh, again, following the pattern from above, uh, we are, ooh, eraser button, it keeps moving on me. I need to think through the, the engineering of my little hack here. Um, so uh, we're going to reconceive now uh, and think about stuff not per unit size, but per unit oriented size. And again, what is the ds vector but uh, something whose magnitude tells me the area. That's its main job, right, is that its magnitude is the area of whatever little piece of surface we're looking at. So it is telling me size. It's just also telling me the direction. It's telling me how my little piece of surface is oriented. So this is an oriented size. And along those lines, if you have quantity per unit oriented size, shouldn't I interpret this thing as an oriented density? And again, the quantity in question being circulation, we're going to call this the curl in this formula, oriented circulation density. So again, broadening our minds as to what the word density can mean. It doesn't have to be quantity per unit size. It can be quantity per unit oriented size, thus the notion of an oriented density. Okay, I know that's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to digest. Give yourself the time as needed. If you need to you know, rewind and listen to this portion of the lecture again, fingers crossed, assuming that the audio has come through, right? <laughs> Knock on wood. I hope that's wood. So there's wood in here somewhere. I don't know. Um, and so um, uh, give yourself that time. It's a lot to chew on. It's a lot to digest. Okay. Um, so that said, um, let me finish the thought here. So curl is telling us two things, just like, whoops, just like gradient was telling us two things. The magnitude is telling us 
How much is the change happening? How steep is this hill? The direction of the gradient is telling us in what direction is that change happening? What is the uh, how is that what direction does that change point? You might say. Okay, so we're going to make the same interpretations down here, and I'm not going to prove this, right? This is just for sort of intuition purposes, which I think is really what more, more of what Math 219 ought to be about. Um, the curl, by virtue of its magnitude, is going to tell you the direction, uh, excuse me, it's going to tell you the amount um, of circulation per unit size. In some sense, this is going to tell you how much of a rotating fluid, um, how strong is this tornado? What category is this hurricane? Right? Uh, is this a lot of circulation of fluid, or is it just a kind of a gentle, slow, you know, uh, teeny tiny? Right? The magnitude of the curl tells you how much of a rotation is happening, uh, and then likewise, the direction of the curl tells you around what axis is that tornado happening around what axis is the fluid you know rotating in in a sense and here's where i'm going to draw these pictures uh just to give uh, uh some sense for uh, again kind of a plausibility check right let's just make sure that this actually uh is consistent with our with our uh, interpretations so again here's the claim whoops the claim ah this button keeps moving on me um the claim is that the curl um, points in a direction that the circulation is around uh, and um, that the magnitude, how long it is, tells me how much, how strong is that rotation. So uh, here we go. Let's go down here to this uh, first picture. Uh, I have a vector field here, you'll notice. And there's a pretty clear uh, rotation of that vector field. The rotation is around this axis here. So we have a, a, a rotation around an axis. Fine. Let's ask the question, uh, how much circulation is there uh, around uh, that curve, that you know, boundary of that little piece of surface? So given a vector field, Given a little piece of surface and its boundary, let's talk circulation. Okay, well, the way it's oriented there, I mean, I, I it just at a glance, it looks like there's going to be significant circulation around that boundary, right? The vector field itself, uh, you can uh, kind of grab the, uh, the vector field here and notice that, uh, yeah, it really is flowing uh, along that curve, right? Oh, gosh, now i got to figure out where this something like that. Um, so significant circulation. And notice that that is consistent with the fact that the curl and the normal vector are pointing the same direction. And so specifically, if you look at curl dot normal vector, reminder, that's what's in the integral. Curl dot normal vector. Right? Curl dot normal vector here is uh, is large. There's a significant curl dot in. And that is compatible with that uh, uh, consistent with the fact that um, F dot DS uh, is significant as well. That makes sense to everybody. So the fluid rotating around the boundary is compatible with the curl being parallel to the normal vector. Okay, so uh, that tracks uh, the way we would want. Now let's look at another example where it goes the other way. Uh, same vector field, you notice. Uh, and uh, let's see here, the vector field, uh, whoops, in the, one of the blue, uh, this vector field Um, I mean, how much circulation is that vector field doing around this boundary? Uh, and I propose, well, not really. It isn't rotating around that boundary. Uh, and the, now here's a hard hand-waving demo, but the uh, vector field 
is doing like this, right? While the boundary is doing like this. Uh, they're just, they're entirely different directions. I mean, like over here um, on the, the right side of the curve, the vector field is like that. It's not going along the curve. And then on the other side, uh, over here at those points, the vector field is sort of down. It's not going along the curve. It's just there is no circulation to be had. And perfectly consistent with that, curl, again, pointing along the axis that, these, that the uh, fluid is rotating around, curl and the normal vector also, uh, uh, whoops, uh, colors also um, not pointing in the same direction we're going to have a small dot product there curl dot in small negligible possibly even zero compatible with the fact that the circulation uh, that we're interested in um, yeah, again this uh, the circulation of the vector field is just not at all uh, along that curve. Everybody okay? Now again, this doesn't prove anything, right? This is just a plausibility argument that, uh, yeah, how about that? The cur curl dot in really is a pretty good stand-in for circulation. Uh, well, I should say circulation density, as I, as I claimed. Okay, so that's the big weird idea. Um, this is why we call curl uh, not just circulation density, but oriented circulation density um, uh, because of uh, how these pictures work out. Okay, uh, one last little thing, uh, a um, kind of a cultural, uh, cultural point. This thing right here, oriented circulation density, um, also sometimes called uh, vorticity which is a cool word because it sounds complicated, right? Uh, but uh, it is in common use in some circumstances. Uh, vorticity is just, uh, it's, a, it's a reference to the word vortex, right? Which means how you know, something is rotating, like a, like a little tornado, right? Um, so vorticity kind of implies, uh, the, the verbiage kind of implies, yeah, this is a measure of in what way is my fluid uh, rotating. And of course, that's what curl does. Curl is a measure of uh, how much and around what axis is my fluid rotating. So it's the perfect word. If you had to pick a single word to represent curl, I would nominate vorticity. Um, but uh, if you get to choose, uh, if you are allowed to have three words, I, 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 like, I think there's more sort of uh, uh, explicit explanation in the term oriented circulation density. Okay, moving along. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some physical examples. Um, we uh, uh, spent some time talking about uh, physical interpretations of uh, of Green's theorem. Uh, excuse me, of Green's operator, right? And so this is a, uh, an example, one way to think about it. Again, Green's operator uh, is a measurement of rotation. So. Uh, as a phys physical metaphor of that, uh, I like to imagine, uh, I think of this as being a, uh, a dead leaf, fell out of a tree, fall colors here, orange, right? Um, and uh, this uh, leaf fell out of a tree and it, onto the surface of a river, let's say, or a surface of a, surface of a little uh, creek or, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know if you all have ever seen leaves floating along a river, anything floating along a river uh, other than a boat, uh, they don't just go, uh, you know, like this. They don't just go, sort of go straight. Um, as they float, they also tend to turn, right? Now, why would that be? Why would the leaf turn? And uh, here's a, uh, a, a an example of why. Uh, very often, when you have uh, water flowing through a river, the velocity of the water is not constant. It'll be greater further away from the edge. Right? This is just how uh, fluid flows work. 
um, uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, the closer you are to the edge, the slower the flow is. The further you get toward the middle, the faster it is. Okay. So now just imagine, um, what's this leaf going to do? It's being pushed significantly harder on what you might call the right side here. And uh, so uh, no surprise, that's going to make the leaf kind of not only move, you know, flow downstream, but it's going to kind of uh, rotate as it does because, again, it's being pushed more on one side than on the other side. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay, so Green's operator is a measurement of this. Right? Green's operator is telling you to what extent there is a rotation intrinsic to the flow of the fluid. Because that's what Green's operator measures. It measures circulation density. To what extent is there a circulation intrinsic to the fluid flow in a given place? Circulation density. So that's a, that's a physical interpretation of Green's operator. And I claim that curl, very, very analogous. Now my metaphor has to change because now we're talking about a three-dimensional uh, operator. So I'm going to need a three-dimensional uh, thing here. And um, I like to imagine uh, little floating balloons, which I like to make red. <laughs> I don't know. You see a lot of red balloons, you know. Uh, so uh, here's here's my uh, here's my floating balloon, and uh, it's you know how uh, when you put helium in a balloon and it goes straight up to the ceiling, right? Um, but then after a few days, it starts to lose a little bit of helium, and there is this perfect moment where it's got the exact same density as air, and it just kind of floats around right and it's not so buoyant that it goes to the ceiling and it's not so empty that it falls onto the floor there's that there's that uh, uh, what do they call it Goldilocks zone right <laughs> where it's got the exact right amount of helium in it um, so imagine that we have those kinds of balloons and uh, I'm sure you've all done this when you have such balloons you could blow on it and it moves right <laughs> but also if you blow on it on one side, you might be able to get it to also rotate, right? So the same phenomenon as the water flowing sort of inconsistently across a, um, uh, across a leaf, a floating leaf. Likewise, if the air is doing something asymmetric, let's say that the air has a rotational aspect to it like that. Right. Well, the balloon's going to do the exact same thing. The balloon will likewise rotate accordingly, right? And so, as curl, excuse me, as uh, yeah, curl measures the rotational aspect of the air. Likewise, the curl is going to measure the rotational aspect of the balloon. Specifically, it's going to do so by giving the axis that the balloon is going to be rotating around um, and by virtue of its magnitude um, uh, some indication of how fast the balloon is going to be rotating and of course there's a lot of constants involved in there uh, it depends on the mass of the balloon it depends on the radius of the balloon moment of inertia probably comes up if I had to guess um, uh, then there's the question of how much uh, stickiness is there between the air and the rubber and oh gosh a lot of details not our problem right but uh, generally speaking longer curl faster rotation does that seem reasonable okay. all right okay um, here's another very important uh, application of curl uh, this is, it has to do with magnetic fields, which, by the way, are very weird. I don't know if any of you all have studied. How many people have had an E&M class and have studied magnetic fields? Just curious. A few of you have. Not Most of you have not. Um, case could be made. Those of you who have not yet seen an E&M course have an advantage because... Uh, you're going to know vector calculus, you're going to understand curl and divergence and the big theorems involved here when you do take an E&M course. And it's a monumental advantage to already understand divergence and curl when you walk into an E&M class. Uh, and students who have not, my apologies, who have not had 
a course in multivariable calculus don't know divergence and curl and these kinds of ideas, well, golly, uh, uh, that's, that's exactly the math that you need to understand E&M fields. And so uh, arguably, uh, very many students end up having to learn E&M without having really the appropriate math that they really ideally should know in advance. So uh, anyway, uh, so be it. So uh, here's uh, an empirical fact about uh, magnetic fields. So we use J to represent a magnetic field. Um, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, we use uh, J to, to uh, represent a, a flow of charged particles, such as uh, like so. Uh, empirical fact, when you have a flow of charged particles, this is called a current field, by the way. Oh, and I need to erase that. Uh, again with the eraser. There we go. Our time is uh, running out on the stylus here. Uh, when you have a flow of charged particles, by the way, very common story, very common story to have a flow of charged particles, uh, current in a wire, right? electricity, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of all over the place, right? Current in a wire is a flow of charged particles. So in such a case, that flow uh, creates uh, something called a magnetic field. And the magnetic field kind of kind of rotates around the, the current field. Now, why is a uh, extremely deep question to which there is no good answer I'm aware of, uh, other than to give more details about how, right? But why? No one knows. This is empirical. Right? No one knows why the universe is set up the way it is. We just got here. The universe was doing its thing, and we're like, oh, well, I guess how that's, that's how that works. Right? But we don't know why. Um, we simply know that this is how it works, and that when you have a flow of charged particles, this thing called a magnetic field goes in kind of in a circular... Uh, it's, like the, it's like the magnetic field is flowing, if you will, sort of around the current field. And we can represent that very conveniently uh, with um, uh, some, uh, some math. Um, our punchline is going to be, um, oh, let's see here. Oh, my stylus is gone. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me plug in the stylus so we can be charging up. Maybe we'll get lucky and can use it again in a few minutes. Until then, I'll work with my finger. Okay, uh, let's see here. So this equation right here is what we're going to be working our way up to. Um, it says that the curl of the magnetic field, keep in mind the magnetic field is what I have here in blue, the curl of the magnetic field is the J field. Right. So what we have in this theorem uh, is kind of a uh, just a, an algebraic manifestation of what we already see. You can see right there that, yeah, the magnetic field is circulating. The magnetic field has a vorticity to it, right? That vorticity is around an axis that points in the direction of the B field. I'm oh, sorry, of the, uh, the, uh, the J field. Sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the, the flow field, the current flow field. Um, so, uh, yeah, the curl of blue is green. So it's just perfectly consistent with that picture. Everybody on board? Now that's just a believability thing. That's that. I, again, I haven't proved anything. Um, now let me uh, talk uh, momentarily about uh, uh, another way to, to say that or another way to see it. Here's something that's empirical. You can directly observe. And I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm so, I don't know how I do that. Uh, this is an empirical fact. Um, you can measure how much magnetic circulation there is. This is an empirical thing you can measure. And you can keep track of how much current is flowing. And just straight up, uh, just empirically measured that uh, the more current you have going through a surface, 
the more magnetic field circulation there will be around the boundary of that surface. Again, just measurable fact. And then, uh, well, once you uh, have uh, that established, let me uh, clean this up, then uh, innocent observation, let's see here, color choices, I'll use dark blue. Um, current, if you think about it, is just an integral of the uh, uh, flow field, dot ds, Let's take, take a moment to, to digest what that says. Keep in mind, J says, J represents the flow of particles. J represents the flow of the fluid. What is flux? The definition of flux is, if you have a vector field representing the flow of the fluid, flux measures how much stuff per unit time is passing through your surface. That's what current is. Current says how many charged particles per unit time are flowing through your surface. Right, so so this uh, what I have in blue there is just uh, kind of a the, the definition again of flux or the definition of current, however you want to say it. Again, this constant here comes along for the ride; uh, it doesn't really uh, do anything there. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, down here, uh, down here, this is just Stokes's curl theorem. Circulation is a flux of curl. So what we have then is a connection between these sort of two different versions of the theorem. Uh, you can think of what we're seeing here as a statement about how uh, the flow field is the curl of the magnetic field, or you can think of it as a statement about how total magnetic circulation um, is proportional to current. More, more green, more blue, in some sense. Everybody good? So, okay, so I, I, this is a wonderful application. Uh, now you could make the case that we haven't actually solved the problem here, but what we have done is we have come to a powerful understanding of the relationship between magnetic fields and current flows, and the thing that makes it come together the thing that makes us allow to connect these interpretations is Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem figures extremely prominently in a, uh, in a discussion of uh, magnetic fields and uh, current flows, etc. All right. Okay. All right. Okay, so back to our Math 212 notes now. Uh, and let's see, we already did this example. Yeah. So uh, you all may recognize this little layout here. We, uh, we wrote something down that was almost exactly identical to this when we were talking about Green's theorem. In fact, just for fun, I am going to go back. Let's see, page 35 is where we are. I want to go back to where we were talking about Green's theorem. Almost there. Surely I'm almost there. Come on, it's got to be. Wow. Did I pass it? Oh, that's right. I forgot all that. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? It's in a different. Um, it's in a different document. You know what? Forget about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I remembered where it was. Um, okay. So um, uh, anyway, hopefully y'all remember. Right, we we drew a picture that looks a lot like this. Um, and uh, this is one of these things where uh, yeah, you can view this picture in two different ways. Um, so you can view this as that we have a starting point and an ending point, and we have on the one hand one curve uh, that starts appropriately and ends appropriately, and then we have a second curve that starts appropriately and ends appropriately. So you could think of this as a picture of two curves that start at the same point and end at the same point, and therefore two curves that have the same boundary. That's one way to think about this picture. Another way to think about this picture is that we have a surface uh, S here, oriented like so, whose boundary Um, is uh, that curve right there, which you notice is C1, 
uh, in the correct orientation, and then in some sense it's C2 but going backwards along C2. Uh, and so the boundary of the surface S uh, is uh, C1 minus C2. So take your pick, right? You can view this as a statement about uh, a surface and its boundary, or you can view this as, sta as a statement about two curves and their boundaries. Everybody see both of those perspectives there? And it's really just a fact of geometry that uh, this is uh, um, kind of weird, right? But this, uh, ge this is the way geometry works. Um, in particular, uh, this minus sign, it always kind of feels like, well, why don't you just orient the C2 the other way, and then we wouldn't have a minus sign there. But if you orient C2 the other way, then you'd have a minus sign there instead. So there is intrinsically, I mean, again, welcome to the physical world that we live in. This is the way geometry works. There is unavoidably a minus sign there. So uh, anyway, uh, at, at this picture, you just got to uh, you know, study this picture, think it through, and notice that this is um, intrinsic to, again, how geometry works. Okay. All right. Now, with all that said, uh, let's uh, look at this picture as a statement about surfaces and their boundary curves and write down Stokes' theorem. There's Stokes' theorem per that observation right there. Right? We have a surface with a boundary curve. The curve has two chunks, C1 and C2, backwards along C2, of course, and so uh, flux of curl is that circulation. Yeah? Okay. It's a matter of writing it down. Uh, here's where that becomes awesome is uh, uh, the, w the things that you can do with this equation once noted. Let's suppose hypothetically, why do I keep going into the pen mode? Uh, I think that's, I, I don't think that's my fault. <laughs> I think the computer's doing it to me. Um, curl being zero, what would that imply? What can I conclude from up here? Well, if the curl is zero, that integrand is zero. Well, that means that this whole integral over here is going to be zero. So the left-hand side of the equation is zero. That means the right-hand side of the equation is zero. What would that mean if the right-hand side of the equation is zero? <clears throat> it would mean those two line integrals are equal. Their difference is zero, therefore they're equal. And if those two line integrals are equal, wait, what? Uh, any two curves that start and end at the same point, those line integrals are always equal? Well, that's the very definition of path independent, which you'll recall we've already seen means that it's a gradient. So what we have here is a kind of geometric intuition for why this, what I've called the lifetime theorem, works. If curl is zero, you've got yourself a gradient. Said differently, if curl is zero, you can find an anti-gradient. There is an anti-gradient to be found. Everybody happy? The reasoning then also works the other way. Uh, this is worth uh, just walking through while we're here. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, suppose you have a gradient. Vector field is a gradient. Well, if it's a gradient, it's path independent. If it's path independent, these two line integrals are equal, which means that the right-hand side is equal to zero, which means that the left-hand side is equal to zero. And here we are again. If we have an integral that's equal to zero, wait a second. This integral is equal to zero no matter what surface we're talking about. For every surface every surface, this integral is zero? What could that integrand possibly be if every integral of it over every surface is always zero? I mean, it just kind of has to be then that that integrand has to be zero. And so again, this uh, is sort of the other half of the, uh, of the lifetime uh, theorems. Uh, so if you have a gradient, then curl is zero. Okay, um, I am a big, big fan of these diagrams. This one that we've drawn here concerning uh, Stokes' curl theorem, you might say. Uh, the one that we drew uh, some time ago, must have been earlier this week, um, 
very similar, totally analogous, looks exactly the same on the page. I did that on purpose, by the way, for to uh, accentuate the comparison, right? Um, the uh, argument here in three dimensions using Stokes' theorem is a shameless ripoff of the analogous argument that we made in two dimensions using Green's theorem. And I would encourage you to pull up those pages and note, oh my gosh, they're Oh my gosh, they're exactly the same argument. They really are. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, okay, new idea. This is a weird one. This is not discussed in the book uh, hardly at all or really at all. And what's weird to me is this is hardly discussed in most multivariable calculus textbooks, and yet it's a really useful idea. Um, it's a very powerful tool for computation. I mean, again, this is not just, you know, ivory tower mathematicians being amused by, uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing uh, abstractions, right? That is not what's going on here at all. This is a powerful computational tool that I'm about to show you. Um, so it's called surface independence. Um, <clears throat> real quick, let me just remind you what path independence means. Path independence means that you get the same value for the line integral as long as C1 and C2, the domains for those integrals, uh, have the same starting and ending points. All right, so two curves that start and end at the same point will always have the exact same value of the line integral. Um, if that happens, then our vector field is path independent. Yes, sir, I, I hope everybody remembers that idea again from earlier this week, I think it was. Surface independence, shameless ripoff, same exact idea, but one dimension up, if you will. Uh, so instead of looking at one-dimensional curves and their zero-dimensional boundary points, we're going to look at a two-dimensional surface and its one-dimensional boundary curve. So here we go. Um, oh, whoops, and again with the, I don't know why it does that. Uh, okay, uh, if we have a surface S1, and another surface S2, and if they have the same boundary, uh, oh, I forgot to, uh, yeah, golly, uh, S2 is down here like this. So surface S1, surface S2, and they have the same boundary, the boundary being this curve. Like so. Yeah, everybody good? Um, <clears throat> now, before we move on, uh, I do want to point out something that's weird about this, and I'll say more about this in a minute, but do notice that the orientation for S1 is upward and kind of has to be upward in order for the boundary of S1 to actually be this orange curve that I've got there. And uh, why? Well, you got to play the right hand game. Think about that, what you might call outward oriented normal and uh, thumb of the right hand, right? Maybe you'd come down and think of it closer to sort of the, the belt there where, you know, where that orange sort of boundary is. And uh, which way does it have to go in order to induce the correct orientation on the boundary? Well, it has to be as drawn that dark green normal vector has to be outward to have the boundary be oriented the way it should be. Um, but the weird thing is you'd think, yeah, 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 outward, didn't we say always outward or something? Uh, not really here. Notice that that lower surface, S2, in order to give me the same boundary, has to be oriented inward. And again, it's just a matter of uh, play the right hand rule game. And uh, if you were to have had it outward, he would sideswipe the wrong direction. So you have to go inward so it'll sideswipe correctly. Counterintuitive kind of feels like these two orientations are pointing opposite of each other. But this is how it works out. 
Everybody see that? It's worth uh, noticing. And, and again, it is an eyebrow raiser. Um, and I am going to talk more about this and why these are seemingly opposite of each other in a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay, so we have two surfaces with the same boundary curve. What we mean by a surf oh wrong color, a surface independent vector field. A vector field is surface independent if whenever you have uh, two surfaces with the same boundary, um, you get the same flux. So one dimension up, right? Two dimensional surfaces with uh, a, a shared one dimensional boundary instead of one dimensional curves with a shared zero dimensional boundary. One dimension up, otherwise shameless rip off of the idea of path independence. Is everybody on board? Okay. All right, so uh, neat fact. Um, just like with path independence, at a glance, it almost seems unfair and impossible. And how could any vector field possibly uh, satisfy such a re preposterously strong requirement? Wait a minute, all surfaces with a shared boundary? Any shared boundary? All surfaces with that shared boundary? They all have to give you the exact same value of the flux? Come on. Seems implausible, right? And yet, um, Stokes' theorem shows that this is not only plausible, it is also um, true for a whole category. I can't seem to erase all these things. Let me just do this. It's true for an entire category of, uh, of vector fields. All curl fields are surface independent. Because if you have a curl, and uh, again, keep in mind, let's uh, think about uh, you know a, a flux through S1, fine. We think about a flux through S2, fine. How would I compute those uh, fluxes through these two surfaces of a curl field, right? Well, a flux of a curl, oh yeah, right. Flux of a curl can be computed on the boundary. Stokes' theorem tells me that the flux through S1 of the curl field is the circulation around the boundary. And likewise, Stokes' curl theorem um, tells me that uh, through S2, the flux of that curl is the circulation around the boundary. And they've got the exact same boundary, and so these two integrals give you the exact same value. Really cool idea, right? And again, a shameless ripoff. When we were talking about path independence, it was um, uh, the fundamental theorem of line integrals that allowed us to show that all gradients were path independent. Here, Stokes' curl theorem shows us that all curls are surface independent. The analogies are overwhelming. Everybody with me? All right. Um, now, <coughs> uh, also true, but much harder to prove, and we're not going to flirt with this uh, in this course. Uh, but not only uh, does uh, does curl imply surface independent, but likewise surface independent also means that it's a curl. So this goes both ways. Every curl is surface independent and vice versa. And again, I'm ignoring regularity issues that throw a nasty nasty uh, wrench into these works. <laughs> um, but uh, again, we're going to ignore all the regularity issues, assume that everything is appropriately uh, 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 continuously differentiable as many times as necessary and uh, uh, sweeping all that under the rug. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, um, we now have the tools necessary to make a third argument that looks just like two previous. We made an argument that looked like this that involved Green's theorem. We made an argument that looked like this that involved Stokes' theorem. And now we're going to go back and talk about Gauss's divergence theorem. And again, a totally similar argument. So uh, now you'll kind of recogni uh, whoops, uh, you'll recognize this picture right here. It's the exact same picture from the previous page. And uh, let's see here. So we have... Um, 
uh, yeah, so let's, uh, so great. So S1 is like that. And uh, S2 is like that. Oh, I wonder if my stylus is working again. Let's see, how are we doing on charge? Ooh, no, it's still not. I don't know why it's not charged. Maybe that's wrong. Maybe it is charged. Yes, I don't trust it. It's charged. It, uh, oh, and now it's telling me the truth. Okay, all right. Yeah, just like uh, you catch someone in a lie, and then they're like, oh, no, I didn't mean that. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, let me uh, fix my little thing here. Let's, let's take a moment. Give you all a mental break while I hack around with this little silly nonsense. And let's see, now i got to get this thing through here. And, of course, I put the eraser uh, button exactly wrong. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, two surfaces with the same shared boundary. And now intuition moment. Uh, if you have one surface and another surface, the state of their boundaries being the same, if you think about you know, the boundary of my left hand and the boundary of my right hand, if the boundaries are going to be the same, that's what it would mean to kind of enclose your hands around something. Right, So the very fact of these two surfaces having the same boundary curve is what makes it the case that there is a solid in here called R whose boundary consists of S1 and S2. Right? But now, um, annoyingly, let's recall that, uh, yeah, but the boundary, excuse me, the orientation on S1 had to be that way and the orientation on S2 had to be that way and so when I say boundary of R now of course boundary of R has to always be outward that's that's a strict rule the word boundary when you're talking about a solid boundary means oriented away from the solid or you know in this in most cases outward so the boundary uh, of R is uh, It's this thing, but it's in the same direction as S1, but it's in the opposite direction as S2. Yep. Can, can you remind me why S2 is pointed in that? Yeah, so S2 has to be pointed that well. In fact, I can just do it right here. Um, uh, S2 kind of has to be pointed in that direction because I need for um, the boundary of S1 and the boundary of S2 to be the same. And so that it's just a matter of kind of following through, um, you know, what is the boundary of S2 as I have it drawn with S2 oriented inward, you play the, the right hand thumb game and uh, swirls and side swipes and that's what makes um, the boundary go the direction that it's supposed to. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. So uh, notice we're in a very similar situation to where we had been. Um, <clears throat> this, um, oh, where's my eraser again? <laughs> There we go. Um, so um, previously, we saw this minus sign, and we couldn't get rid of that minus sign. I mean, I guess I could orient C2 the other direction, but then I'd have a minus sign show up there. And you just can't get around the fact that there is unavoidably, geometry itself dictates that in when I set things up this way, there is going to be a minus sign, right? Um, said differently. These two curves here, you're going to feel a temptation to pass judgment on whether or not those two curves are oriented the same or whether they're oriented backwards of each other. And let's, let's, let's play that game here. Uh, are these two curves oriented the same or are they oriented backwards? Well, here's the deal. If you think about their boundaries... They're oriented the same because they have the same start and the same end, and thus they have the 
same boundaries. So in that sense, they're oriented the same. But thought of not in terms of their boundaries, but thought of in terms of how they are the boundary of something else, this one, uh, this first curve is oriented what you might call the right way, and the second curve, thought of as part of the boundary of the surface, is the one that's oriented backwards. So, well, wait a second then. Which is it? Are these two curves oriented the same, or are they oriented backwards? We've got to decide which is it. It seems like we have contradictory cases here. Right? And the answer is very subtle. The answer is, is it's a ridiculous question. There is no comparison. These are different curves. Orientations are something you apply to a curve, right? So here is a curve. Um, I can compare, um, and I want to be in the higher mode, I can compare one orientation on that curve with a different orientation on the same exact curve, these two orientations I can compare because they're on the same curve. Uh, these are two different curves. There is no actual comparison between their orientations. So that's an illusion, and you want to make sure to stay away from that little landmine of, uh, of yeah, but are they the same or are they different? It really kind of, first of all, there is no answer to that question. It's a bad question. Second of all, it kind of depends on what sense you would mean. And so there is no contradiction here at all. And so likewise here, when you're talking about these two surfaces, um, do these two surfaces, uh, let me get clean up the mess here. Um, these two surfaces... S1 and S2, are they oriented the same or are they oriented opposite? Well, in terms of their shared boundary, they're oriented the same. By the way, notice they're both oriented upward, you might say. Right? So in a set, there is a temptation to say these two surfaces are oriented the same. Because they're both upward, they both have the same shared boundary curve. But in terms of, forget about their shared boundary, just think about how they relate to the, oh, I wanted yellow. How do they relate to the boundary of something else? Well, that's where one of them is the same and one of them is the opposite, and thus this minus sign. So again, it depends on how you want to think about it. Uh, they're both upward, cool, but one's inward, one's outward. Uh, so not cool. Uh, anyway, all illusion. There is no comparison between these orientations. They're different surfaces. Okay, is everybody on board? Okay, I'm out of time. So uh, we'll pick up here next time and uh, 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 finish up Chapter 15 on Monday, I hope. Fingers crossed. Okay, see you all later. Have a good one.